Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, on behalf of the Institution of Royal Engineers, our humble thanks. Well, I've been a member of the Royal Engineers for nearly 43 years and uh, a member of this institution here for 37. And I can assure you, certainly from my living memory, this is the first such uh, joint occasion. But I would like to stress, as Peter has stressed, that this is not just a love-in between the Royal Engineers and the RUSI. We hope it's of, as the audience, I hope, shows a much wider interest to the Army, uh, to, to defense, and uh, internationally, because such is the importance of this subject. But if, I, uh, if you allow me to indulge you a little bit of history for a couple of minutes, um, looking back in the Royal Engineers history, we've, we found that about 130 years ago, there was uh, a sort of move of some sort of cooperation uh, between the two. And uh, if I quote from the annual meeting of the Royal Engineers in 1888, um, I quote, that the first efforts of the Royal Engineers Institute be now devoted towards obtaining suitable premises in London, in which the publications of the Institute may be discussed and in which meetings may be held, and with this in view, that a committee be appointed to make arrangements with the Council of the Royal United Service Institution. Well, as you probably have worked out, it didn't quite work out as hopeful, and a, plow, a plan to house the great Royal Engineers Library in this building foundered because the anticipated annual expenditure for a caretaker, lighting and heating was deemed too considerable, and the matter was quietly dropped. Plus a change. Well, there was a silver lining, or at least the prospect of one. The core history goes on to record that the RUSI said that they would always be willing to lend their lecture theater to the Royal Engineers for meetings and discussions. So here we are, 130 years on, and therefore I offer to the RUSI a belated thank you. But in fact, ladies and gentlemen, the cooperation between the Royal Engineers and the RUSI, and I would say equally uh, for the Royal Artillery, was not extraordinary. These institutions were at the forefront of military thinking and tactical and technical development in the 19th century. And those institutions, RUSI, Royal Engineers, and Royal Artillery, all owe their foundations to initiatives following the experiences of the Napoleonic Wars. And the RUSI journals and other publications used to contain many articles from Royal Engineers, Royal Artillery, and Royal Naval officers. And one can think of the remarkable Chesney brothers, two engineers, and indeed the RUSI's highest award, the Chesney Gold Medal, is named after one of them. But today, and this is a subject that pains me observing over the last 30 or 40 years, that remarkably few officers of the British Army write now for journals such as the RUSI. So we have yet to achieve or to regain CGS's brain-based approach in this regard, designed, amongst other things, to provoke innovative thinking, a new discourse about the profession of arms. But we have taken the initiative and seek to sharpen our intellectual edge, and so match, hopefully, CGS's ambition. And that's one of the reasons for the re-establishment of the Royal Engineers Historical Society, which is the research and outreach arm of the institution of the Royal Engineers, uh, which I have the honor, the, the RHS, which I have the honor of chairing. Now, our motto is simply bridging the past to the present for the future, a pragmatic sapper adaption of Basil Liddell Hart's famous dictum, I quote, the practical value of history is to throw the film of the past through the material projector of the present onto the screen of the future. Now, this illuminating description neatly takes us to today's conference on urban warfare, past, present, future, looking at historical perspectives, contemporary challenges, uh, contemporary operations, and future challenges. In his recently published work, major work entitled the future of war, Sir Lawrence Friedman reminds us, I quote, historically big battles for cities have been painful. 
Stalingrad is just one example of how hard it is to defeat stubborn defenders. In Vietnam, US Marines took heavy casualties in the struggle for control Hue, comparable to some of the worst fighting of the Pacific War. And the Russian experience, crazy bloodbath of Grozny as another example. And recent military exercises have indicated that it would take a modern rifle company about 12 hours to take one city block with an unsustainable level of casualties. Simply put, fighting vertically as opposed to horizontally over, has to overcome some really demanding physics, not least ballistics. So some real scientific inquiry and method is required here. So we can't afford to ignore two rather basic, uncomfortable, but seemingly obvious truths. First, cities are the most challenging and intensely costly environments for armed forces to fight in, let alone fight through. Secondly, cities, and particularly their dystopian big cousins, megacities, are bound to grow in numbers and size and therefore compound the complexity of the problem. Yet, if these issues were that obvious, you might well ask, why haven't Western armed forces invested more in force development, in equipment, training, organization, etc., to address these issues which will not go away? Where are the great experimental forces and exercises, and what resources have been committed, both intellectual and material? Well, we will hear in the course of today, I'm confident, some fascinating insights, if not answers, to these questions from the practitioners. And I hope, as Peter said, that will offer much food for thought, and I hope it will provide a springboard of action rather than just more discussion. So as one of the co-organizers, I'd like to thank not only the RUSI once again, but in advance, all the speakers and panel chairs and this full house, please ask some probing, searching questions. I'd now like to turn, ladies and gentlemen, to introducing our most distinguished keynote speaker, Sir Anthony Beaver, and his subject. Allow me a few words of background and context first. The 2nd of February, 2018, today marks the 75th anniversary of the German capitulation at the Battle of Stalingrad. No coincidence uh, for today's date. And most uh, historians of the Second World War agreed that this momentous and decisive battle marks one of the great, if not the greatest, turning points of the war, confirming that Germany could not win against the Soviet Union. As we'll hear shortly, it was an extraordinary contest, an extremely hard-fought, bitter battle of machines and men, terrain and weather, into which fiery cauldron both Hitler and Stalin staked all and threw everything at this disposal. And somewhere at the back of my memory, when researching another book one time, I, Hitler at one stage <clears throat> decided to throw in no fewer than 15 assault engineer battalions into the battle, which were consumed in a matter of days, not weeks. So quite apart from studying the decisions of the senior military commanders, such as Friedrich Paulus and Georgi Zhukov, and assessing the operational art, tactics, and technologies involved, one can only marvel at the tenacity of the fighting troops and pity their intense suffering and sacrifice. Yet, ladies and gentlemen, there is one community that is too easy to overlook, the brave citizens of Stalingrad who endured and gave so much during this terrible battle. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor to announce the presence in this hall today of Dr. Edward Ochegevier. Edward, if you stand up, please. Uh, Edward's uh, memoir is in your packs. As a six-year-old boy, son of an American engineer working at the famous Stalingrad tractor factory, Dr. Ochegevier witnessed the opening stages of the battle in which he was machine gunned, bombed out, and escaped across the river Volga under intense artillery fire remarkably surviving an arduous trek across the steppe and one of the harshest winters of the 20th century. His memoir of these events, combined that of his half-sister Natalia's, is one of the most moving 
and as Strike and I've uh, read of that, of that period. So please take the opportunity during the breaks, if you're interested in the human aspects of this, uh, uh, to, to engage with uh, Edward. Sir Anthony Beaver needs little introduction to this military audience, uh, largely military audience. His mighty roll call of books from Spanish Civil War advancing steadily through Crete, Berlin, and D-Day to the German Ardennes Offensive of 1944 all make compelling reasons. But I suspect I'm far from alone asserting that his award-winning account of Stalingrad, published 20 years ago in 1998, represents his best-known work, indeed one of the most important military histories, combining fast-moving narrative, astute analysis, and gritty eyewitness accounts which bring the battle in all its horrors and complexities to life. Many military historians have sought to emulate Santony Beaver's flowing style, substance, and humanity, and wider impact. Few have done so. So without further ado, Sir Anthony Beaver, you have the floor to speak on Stalingrad 75 years on. Thank you. Mango, thank you very much indeed. The geopolitical turning point of the Second World War in fact came in December 1941 with the Wehrmacht's failure to take Moscow and Hitler's declaration of war on the United States. The psychological turning point did not come until a year later with the Battle of Stalingrad. The Red Army's astonishing encirclement and subsequent destruction of Hitler's largest formation, the Sixth Army, showed to the world that the all-conquering Nazi war machine had overreached itself. It had passed its cumulative point. The Red Army now had the initiative on the Eastern Front. The Battle of Stalingrad could also be said to mark another turning point in the history of war. Sieges of towns and cities, which had been such a feature of later medieval and early modern warfare, had become increasingly rare in the late 18th century in the new age of revolutionary warfare, the nation in arms. Battles tended to take place in open spaces between identifiable national armies trying to maneuver for advantage. During the Napoleonic Wars, land operations extended from Portugal to Russia, yet very few towns were besieged and stormed. The British sack of Badajoz was a notable exception. Generals were afraid of losing men through desertion, often as large a drain on manpower as disease in those days. And they were well aware of the dangers of discipline collapsing as soon as alcohol was found. But the key reason for avoiding urban warfare in those days was that the military training and the weapons of the day were totally unsuited. In Napoleonic times, the bulk of conscripts from rural communities the disposable sons, to use Edward Lutfak's phrase, had hardly seen a big city. But by 1914, a century later, internal migrations had swollen the capitals of Europe. Cities now provided a large share of the conscripts, and many of them felt completely lost in the countryside. But the interesting aspect of the First World War is once again how there was very little urban combat. Towns were on occasions bombarded with heavy artillery or bombed by aircraft or zeppelins, but there was virtually no street fighting. In 1939, at the start of the Second World War, cities such as Warsaw and Rotterdam were bomb bombed savagely. But in the Western European theater, towns were usually declared open and abandoned to the enemy. On the 11th of June, 1940, during the collapse of the French army, Winston Churchill urged its general staff to defend Paris with house-to-house -house fighting. This idea was greeted with absolute horror by General Végon and Marshal Pétain. Pétain, who had just returned from being ambassador to General Franco in Spain, no doubt shuddered at the thought of the street fighting during the Spanish Civil War. This was revolutionary warfare, and it handed power to the industrial workers, 
as the Spanish anarchist defeat of the generals rising in Barcelona in July 1936 had shown. Petain's reactionary instincts were right about one aspect, however, as events in Stalingrad would prove. Lesson one, commanders lose control of events far more rapidly in an urban setting than in the open. The total warfare on the Eastern Front between 1941 and 1945 was quite clearly the culmination of the ideological process which had accelerated during the 1930s. Mass militarization combined with mass indoctrination. The Battle of Stalingrad, which lasted from the 26th of August, 1942, until the 2nd of February, 1943, became the most famous example of city fighting. The conquest of Stalingrad had never been part of the plan in Falblau, the Operation Blue. It only became an objective later to provide Hitler with an ersatz victory to distract from the Wehrmacht's failure to capture the oil fields of the Caucasus. Apart from street battles in Voronezh shortly before, Hitler had up until then done his utmost to keep his troops out of defended cities. The plan of Operation Barbarossa the year before had not been to occupy Leningrad or Moscow. The intention had been to destroy both cities and annihilate their civilian populations. Stalingrad was targeted by Hitler mainly because it bore Stalin's name. And Stalin felt equally strongly that the city with his name must not fall if he was to retain credibility as war leader. So, in the words of Lavrenti Beria, his secret police chief, Stalingrad became a battle of rams. So, lesson two, cities imbued with a symbolic resonance for propaganda reasons become dangerously obsessive objectives for both political leaders and for the media. To the dismay of German commanders, General Tchikov, the Soviet commander of the 62nd Army, ordered his men to keep their defensive positions almost within a grenade throw of the Germans. This made it very hard or almost impossible for the Luftwaffe to attack the Red Army positions uh, without also hitting their own men. Lesson three, in urban warfare, it is the defender who usually manages to determine the tactics. The great mistake by the German high command was to carpet bomb the city as Paulus's Sixth Army approached. The ruins provided the perfect killing ground, with anti-tank mines concealed in rubble, anti-tank guns hidden in battered buildings, and storm groups ready to attack out of ruins, cellars, and even sewers. Stalingrad represented a new form of warfare concentrated in the ruins of civilian life. The detritus of war, burnt out tanks, shell cases, signal wire, and grenade boxes was mixed with the wreckage of family homes iron bedsteads, lamps, and household utensils. Vasily Grossman wrote of the fighting in the brick-strewn, half-demolished rooms and corridors of apartment blocks, where there might still be a vase of withered flowers or a boy's homework open on the table. In an observation post, high in a ruined building, an artillery spotter seated on a kitchen chair might watch for targets through a convenient shell hole in the wall. German infantrymen, found close quarter combat disorientating because it broke conventional military boundaries and dimensions. Tall buildings could be like a layered cake, as one eyewitness put it, with Germans on the top floor, Russians below them, and more Germans underneath them. The defender could use sewers and tunnels to penetrate to the rear of the front line. Often, an enemy was hard to identify, with every uniform impregnated by the same dun-colored dust from pulverized brick and masonry. The close-quarter combat in ruined buildings, cellars, and sewers was soon dubbed Rattenkrieg by German soldiers. It possessed a savage intimacy which appalled their generals. Extra men were needed to make sure that the enemy did not slip between adjacent companies to attack from the flank or rear or by mouse-holing through cellar walls to appear in unexpected places. Lesson four, fighting in built-up areas always consumes far more troops than the planners imagine. German generals do not seem to have imagined what awaited their divisions in the ruined city. The enemy is invisible, wrote the German corps commander, General Strecker, to a friend. 
Ambushes out of basements, wall remnants, hidden bunkers and factory ruins produce heavy casualties among our troops. The decision to assault Stalingrad um, <coughs> had deprived the Wehrmacht of its great blitzkrieg advantages and reduced its ground forces to the techniques of the First World War. Even though, as Jürgen Forster pointed out, their military theorists had argued that trench warfare had been an aberration in the art of war. The Sixth Army, for example, found itself having to respond to Soviet tactics by reinventing the storm wedges introduced in January 1918. Assault groups of 10 men armed with a machine gun, light mortar, and flamethrowers for clearing ruined buildings. Lesson five, the attacker is not only likely to lose control over events, but also to lose much of their advantage in superior weaponry, mobility, and training. Soviet accounts make much of the way that in their desperate defense of certain positions on the west bank of the Volga, officers, Red Army officers, would call down artillery and Katusha fire on their own positions as they were overrun. Soviet artillery was massed on the east bank under General Voronyov. There simply was not room for them on the west bank with Soviet toeholds often limited to no more than a few hundred meters. Yet the Katusha rocket trucks were still brought across the river by night and set up on top of the steep banks with their rear wheels dangling dangerously over the edge to give them greater range. Artillery observation in the city was difficult for both sides. So the Germans, too, suffered from their own fire support. This danger in urban warfare became even more evident two and a half years later, when five Soviet armies were fighting inwards towards the center of Berlin. Each one was supported by an attached aviation uh, army with Sturmovic fighter bombers as well as their own artillery. As a result, the further in that they advanced, the more they were bombed and bombarded by their own neighbors. Nobody can be sure, but I would not be surprised if the Red Army lost almost as many men in Berlin through their own ordnance as from enemy fire. So lesson six is self-evident. Fighting in built-up areas greatly increases the danger of blue-on-blue -blue casualties. German commanders openly admitted the Russian expertise at camouflage, but few acknowledged that it had been the relentless bombing of Stalingrad by their own aircraft, which had produced the ideal conditions for the defenders. Not a house is left standing, a lieutenant wrote home. There is only a burnt out wasteland, a wilderness of rubble and ruins, which is well nigh impassable. The plan of the Soviet commander, General Chuikov, was to funnel and fragment German mass assaults with breakwaters. These were strengthened buildings manned by infantry with anti-tank rifles and machine guns. These would deflect the attackers into channels where camouflaged T-34 tanks and anti-tank guns waited half buried in the rubble behind. When German tanks attacked with infantry, the defenders' main priority was to separate them. The Russians used trench mortars, aiming to drop their bombs just behind the tanks to scare off the accompanying infantry, while the anti-tank gunners went for the panzers. The channeled approaches would also be mined in advance by sappers, whose casualty rate was the highest of any specialization in Stalingrad. Make a mistake and no more dinners was their unofficial motto. Much of the fighting, however, did not consist of major attacks, but of relentless, lethal little conflicts. One of uh, Chuikov's officers wrote that the battle was fought by assault squads, generally six or eight men strong from the Stalingrad Academy of Street Fighting, as they called it. They armed themselves with knives and sharpened spades for silent killing, as well as submachine guns and grenades. The assault squads sent into the uh, sewers were strengthened with flamethrowers and sappers bringing explosive charges to lay under German positions. A more general tactic evolved based on the realization that the German armies were short of reserves. Trikov ordered an emphasis on night attacks, mainly for the practical reason that the Luftwaffe could not react to them, but also because he was convinced 
that the Germans were more frightened during the hours of darkness and would become exhausted. The German Lancer came to harbor a special fear of the Siberians from Colonel Batyuk's uh, 284th Rifle Division, who were considered to be natural hunters of any sort of prey. If only you could understand what terror is, a German soldier wrote. At the slightest rustle, I pull the trigger and fire off tracer bullets and bursts from the machine gun. The compulsion to shoot at anything that moved at night, often setting off fusillades from equally nervous sentries down a whole sector, undoubtedly contributed to the German Sixth Army's expenditure of more than 25 million rounds during the month of September 1942 alone. The Russians also kept up the tension by firing flares into the night sky from time to time to give the impression of an imminent attack. Soviet propaganda claimed that 60,000 civilians had died in Stalingrad, mainly in the bombing by uh, General von Richthofen's uh, air fleet force. It's impossible to determine the number of <coughs> civilians who were still trapped on the West Bank by the time of the September battles. But the figure must be well over 30,000. Only 10,000, of which 1,000 were children, were found alive when the battle ended. And those children were simply catatonic or completely feral. The NKVD rifle regiments under Major General Sarayev had, on Stalin's orders, prevented evacuation across the Volga as the Germans advanced. The Soviet leader, in a characteristically brutal calculation, had reasoned that his soldiers might fight harder and not abandon the West Bank if there were still women and children there. This decision was a hideous miscalculation. When the order was finally lifted, Stukas attacked the river ferries packed with fleeing civilians to deadly effect. Would any Western army have managed to hold on to Stalingrad in September and October 1942 against what was thrown at it? I think not. Western armies retained a notion that suffering had a limit at which point you could surrender. The Red Army, far more under Stalin's thumb than the Wehrmacht was under Hitler's, had no such qualification. Undoubtedly, the biggest challenge when writing about Stalingrad was to provide some sort of answer to that fundamentally difficult question. Did the Red Army manage to hold on against all expectations just through genuine bravery and self-sacrifice? Or was it because they feared <coughs> the NKVD and Komsomol blocking groups behind and the ever-present threat of execution by the special detachments, soon to be known as Smash? We cannot tell for sure whether a minority or a majority of soldiers panicked in the early stages of the battle in late August and September. In that early period, before the political department of the Stalingrad Front felt able to claim on the 8th of October uh, the sinister claim, the defeatist mood is almost eliminated and the number of treasonous incidents is getting lower. The proportion might well have amounted to more than a minority. According to John Erickson, some 13,500 executions, most of them summary, were carried out during the Stalingrad campaign. Jochen Helbeck, on the other hand, cites the official Soviet figure of just 300, which is utterly impossible to believe if you read the daily reports of the political departments, especially when the total of executions in the Red Army during the Second World War is said to have exceeded 300,000. At the same time, there can be no doubt about the astonishing resolution of many, if not most, Red Army soldiers to hold on to their diminishing foothold on the West Bank of the Volga. They felt a, a personal hatred and anger that the Germans had penetrated as far as the Volga, which was seen as the, the, the central, the main artery of the whole country. The slogan, coined by the political department of the 62nd Army, struck a real chord. There is no land for us on the other side of the Volga. They were determined to hold on to that tiny little patches, the, the tiny little patches that they had left on that West Bank. Even surrender was not necessarily an escape for German soldiers. On the Eastern Front, there was no Geneva Convention nonsense of sticking to name, rank, and number. 
I'll never forget uh, one protocol of interrogation by the chief of intelligence of the 62nd Army at Stalingrad working through an interpreter. At the bottom of the page, there was a scribbled note to say that the interrogation had been terminated because the subject had died of his wounds. But where did the extraordinary Russian capacity to endure such suffering come from? Catherine Meridel has rightly underlined the hardening process which the Soviet peoples endured during the First World War, the Civil War, the ensuing famines and Stalinist repression, to say nothing of the Second World War itself. Richard Overy, in his uh, book, Russia's War, emphasized that Soviet endurance had little to do with Communist Party propaganda. The Tsarist armies, he wrote, between 1914 and 1917, averaged 7,000 casualties a day. Between 1941 and 1945, the death rate averaged 7,950. Not that much of a difference. Over it sought a cultural explanation in Russian life, where collectivism was preferred to individualism. These traditions were borrowed and enlarged by Soviet communism, he added. Orlando Feiges disagreed with this explanation. He underlined the effect of the blocking detachments of the NKVD uh, troops and the Komsomol groups armed with machine guns. But probably in their different ways, they are both right, because it was a combination of the two. But I also suspect that the apparent imperviousness to suffering came from a tacit resignation of inevitable death. Veterans will tell you that those who dreamed about the end of the war and returning home very seldom made it. The survivors themselves had never dared to believe that they would come out in alive. They had just existed by day by day. And I might mention just in passing that curiously, the pattern of survival in concentration camps was exactly the opposite. Those who resigned themselves seldom made it. They were nicknamed the Muslim. On the other hand, those who focused their determination on staying alive to see their family again or clung to religious or strong political beliefs were the ones most likely to survive. Soldiers on the Eastern Front were afraid both of their enemy and of execution by their own side. This put them under terrible psychological pressure. They and Soviet civilians were crushed between the two totalitarian regimes. Red Army snipers at Stalingrad, for example, were ordered to shoot starving Russian children who'd been tempted with crusts of bread by German infantrymen to fill their water bottles in the Volga. As recent city fighting in Syria and Iraq has tended to underline, there is something uniquely pitiless about urban warfare. This is almost certainly linked to the unpredictable and close quarter nature of the battle. It also makes a soldier harden his heart against the immense suffering of civilians all around. And it, it can easily become even more dehumanizing than war in the open. When it comes to training for urban warfare, uh, this is a human dimension which should also not be forgotten. Thank you very much.